so friends in this video we are starting with the central excise rules year 2002 in total there are 33 rules but actually relevant rules are up to 30 only okay and the text of the rules I have already provided you in the form of material I am also going through that plus whatever value addition is required that I am going to do right open the text read with me and wherever necessary I will go for further explanation here rule number one what is given in rule number one this is simply talking about applicability where the rules will be applicable and this says that these rules may be called central excise rules 2002 then they extend to whole of India and they shall come into force on the first day of March 2002 in other words I must tell you because section 1 of the central excise act also says that the act extends to whole of India and section 5a giving the power to the government to allow the exemptions and various area wise exemptions have been given like northeast exempted Jammu Kashmir exempted Kutch district exempt so that way time being exemptions are allowed so when the exemptions are there you can say that the for the time being provisions of the act are not applicable so where act is not applicable automatically rules are also not applicable so when we say in rule one that provisions are applicable throughout india in other words you can say wherever central excise act is applicable this is also applicable okay now coming to rule number two and few important definitions are there rule number two and here we have few definitions which are relevant for the purpose of exam directly definitions are generally not asked but sometimes those become relevant now in this the first relevant definition is in clause number b that is assessment clause number b and the title is assessment right now this you can understand in two parts what is the meaning thereof and what is the definition thereof as far as meaning is concerned it simply means determining duty liability and for deciding the duty liability two things are important number one value for that we have already done the chapter of valuation number two which is important that is rate of duty and rate of duty depends on classification so that also we have done and in majority of the cases both the things have to be done by the SAC himself he determines the value he determines the rate of duty then he calculates the amount of duty it is paid after payment he files a return and then those returns can be scrutinized by the departmental officers okay so this is the meaning now what definition says assessment includes self assessment of duty made by assessee and provisional assessment under rule number 7 so here this says this includes this is inclusive right so assessment whether by the departmental officer or by the RCC everything is covered in one word that is that is the word assessment so assessment includes number one self assessment by RCC and number two provisional assessment 
and provisional assessment we will read in detail when we go to rule number 7 in these rules. So rule number 7 talks about what is provisional assessment. So as far as definition is concerned this part is relevant but for understanding this is necessary that assessment means determining the current correct amount of duty payable right but the definition says that this includes not only self assessment this also includes provisional assessment so when we come to rule number 6 we'll talk about all types of assessment and under rule number 7 we'll talk about provisional assessment as well so everything will be covered up in detail then in clause number c this defines assessee clause number c who is assessee so when we were doing the chapter of valuation in section 4 subsection 3 clause a we already talked about who is assessee here it is to a certain extent there is a repetition of the definition read with me what the definition is it means any person who is liable for payment of duty assessed or producer or manufacturer of the excisable goods or registered person of a private warehouse in which excisable goods are stored and includes an authorized agent now understand this carefully the first wordings are any person who is liable for payment of duty any person liable to pay duty so in majority of the cases it is the manufacturer who is liable to pay but in case of molasses it is also the person who is the procurer he has to pay and certain goods when manufactured on job work basis it is the principal who is the liable to pay right so here we have not gone into the detail who is the liable to pay but here we are simply saying the person who is liable to pay the duty under different provisions of the act and rules he will be referred as RCC. Now go further or a producer or manufacturer of the excisable goods. This is saying or right. So either here or here or producer or manufacturer of excisable goods then third part is also there and the third part says a registered person of a private warehouse in which excisable goods are stored and includes an authorized agent thereof so here we can use the word warehouse keeper right but this warehouse is the warehouse where finished goods are deposited outside the factory without payment of duty so these three persons so the first of all the person who is liable to pay the duty or the person who is the producer or manufacturer or the warehouse keeper and includes their agent so plus their agent so where the principal has authorized somebody else to do the to do to do the job or to discharge the liability then the agent of the principal will also be considered as an assessee right in 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 other words if i tell you the meaning assessee means the whose duty liability is assessed or rather who is responsible to pay duty he will be called as assessee after this another relevant definition that is in clause number EA and that talks about who is the large taxpayer. Clause number EA. Large tax Payer. Friends, here we will talk about the large taxpayer units in a separate rule, but in Sandwet Credit, we already talked about who is the large taxpayer. So, the relevant definition is from here. So, large taxpayer, this is requirement number one having permanent account number 
under income tax act first requirement requirement number 2 having one or more registered premises requirement number 3 fulfills the criteria prescribed so three things are there number one who is having the permanent account number under the income tax act number two who is having one or more registered premises number three who is fulfilling the criteria laid down now this criteria this is important right the first two things are very very simple but what is that criteria now to mention that i need to remove this and since the text is already with you you can refer there but write the prescribed criteria and the criteria is in two ways from the point of view of income tax as well as from the point of view of excise and service tax so for this the prescribed criteria either of the two and this says who has paid who has paid income tax for preceding financial year or advance tax for current financial year not less than rupees 10 crores who has paid income tax for the preceding financial year or advance tax for the current financial year not less than rupees 10 crores right either this or paid central excise or service tax or both during preceding financial year but excluding amount of send back credit not less than rupees 5 crores so this is the net payout by the person other than amount of send back credit so either this criteria is satisfied or this criteria is satisfied then the person is a large tax payer and for the large tax payer the government has given different facilities and those facilities are optional for the acc so whether he wants to avail that or not that is up to him so those things we will read in detail again when we move further but we have already covered up to a large extent under the senvet credit rules so friend these are relevant definitions as far as rule number 2 is concerned now here from we move to rule number 3 and rule number 3 talks about the officers and their jurisdiction and their authority rule number 3 in rule number 3 basically three things are there number 1 is appointment number 2 jurisdiction and number 3 authority three things are there in this rule as far as appointment is concerned all by central board all the officers will be appointed by the central board right jurisdiction of principal chief commissioner
chief commissioner principal commissioner commissioner and commissioner appeal these are by cbc there are junior officers as well like assistant commissioner deputy commissioner superintendent and other officer their jurisdiction will be decided by the commissioner and other senior officers so these are the officers for whom the jurisdiction will be determined by cbc itself as far as authority is concerned number 1 authority given under the act and rules what authority can be exercised by the officers so whatever authority has been given to them under the act or the rules that can be exercised by the officers then authority of junior officers authority of junior officers so whatever authority is vested in the officer he can exercise all those authorities and he can also exercise the powers of his subordinate officer but here we have to remember that there is section 12e section 12e says the commissioner appeal should not exercise the power of adjudicating authority because adjudicating officer may be below the rank of commissioner appeals but commissioner appeal should not exercise the power of adjudicating authority so here it is given that the office that the, every officer will have the authority to exercise the powers given to his his subordinate officer also but it is subject to section 12e and section 12e says the commissioner appeals the commissioner appeals should not exercise powers of adjudicating authority now why this is prohibited friends when i was explaining you the concept of adjudicating authority and central excise officer there i explained that adjudication means determination of the fact whether acc has complied with the applicable provisions or not and then the accordingly decision is taken by the officer and order is passed and if the order is not liked by the acc then he can go for appeal so in other words you can say where the role of adjudicating authority ends there the role of appellate authority begins if appeal is filed so both the authorities are absolutely independent of each other the adjudicating authority and appellate authority so that's why section 12e says that the commissioner appeal should not exercise the powers of adjudicating authority and this is because of this provision which is a part of rule number 3 also this says that every officer is having the right to exercise the power of his subordinate officer also but subject to this that the commissioner appeal should not exercise the powers of the adjudicating authority